it's, it's great to be here and, you know, what a treat to wake up in the morning to, well, yes, that raucous screeching sound of the kia. It seemed really most appropriate. But to start off, I guess I want to put a few things, I guess, in context from where I come from, you know, being brought up in the Ed Hillary household. I mean, we've come down to places like this and further south, but we were always drawn back to the Southern Alps. And wherever we were as a family, we'd sit around the dining room table. But the, the thing that really stood out for me when I look back on it is Dad wasn't one of those guys who sat at the head of the table telling his kids about what he had done. He was interested in what you were going to do or what you were doing. He was very much a forward-thinking sort of person. And they dominated uh, the topics around our dining room table. Every so often, though, that did change. And I, I think it was probably a catalyst, like I don't know, a visiting American or European climber was staying with us. And inevitably, stories would come out from some of those well, almost legendary experiences, like he and Tenzing crawling out of that little tent up there at uh, over eight kilometers in the air, heading out on the 29th of May <coughs> to create history on the summit of Mount Everest. But I remember Dad saying to us kids that they were moving up the slope to what was called the south summit of the mountain. And with those big long ice axes, chopping steps, and the slope was really quite slabby, steep, hard snow and ice would break off in sheets and shoot down into the Kang Shan Glacier over four kilometers below. And Dad said, you know, I started to have doubts. I really started to think, this is not safe. This is not <laughs> a really sensible thing to be doing. If I was back home in the Southern Alps. You know, I'd say, let's head down and sort of uh, think about this and maybe come back in a week's time. He's looking down at Tenzing, and Tenzing's looking a bit, I'm sure. And he said, there was that, you know, that little internal voice we all have. And it sort of spoke out. He said, inside of him, it said, Ed, my boy, this is Everest. Sometimes you've got to be a little more persistent, take on a little more risk, and just keep going. And he looked down at Tenzing, he said, and they sort of nodded their heads at each other and smiled. And of course, they carried on. And the rest really was history. But the great thing about that expedition was their success, which of course the rest of the team didn't know about for about a day and a half, was a team success. They all felt successful. And I think that's an important story in terms of getting things done, a group of people who make an amazing achievement a reality. Well, just uh, a few years ago, 2013 was the 60th anniversary of the first ascent of Mount Everest, and it was really very appropriate that it was held at the Royal Geographical Society in London. You know, the vaulted ceilings, the history, the empire, all of that sort of stuff. And a group of mountaineers converged on London and would get up and we'd speak briefly about what this climb really meant. And at exactly 8 p.m. at the evening, there was a knock on the door at the side of the RGS auditorium. And in came a gentleman who said, all stand, and everyone in this vast auditorium stood up and in came Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip and they filed up onto the stage, shook hands, all of us, the speakers, the mountaineers, who'd been talking about Mount Everest in 1953 and our own experiences. And as Prince Philip came by, I shook him by the hand. I said, you know, how much my father would have loved to have been here. And without any pause or hesitation, Prince Philip looked up at the great vaulted ceilings of the Royal Geographical Society and said, oh, well, he'll be around here somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, in a way, he's right. You know, that restless energy of Ed Hillary, that restless energy for you know, mountaineering and climbing, but also building little schools and hospitals 
for kids and making a difference to people's lives, it certainly is still around with us. And around the same time in 2013 came out a new film uh, about that crime. It was made here in New Zealand um, <coughs> called Beyond the Edge, using a lot of the old original footage and some reenactments. And I just want to show you now um, a little piece out of this. Oopsie Daisy, can, can I get some help with finding the, um, <laughs> the screen? Uh, and um, if you just diminish the screen and find my little film, I'll just show you a, a couple of minutes of this old historic footage. This one here is double click on that. It should do. Have you got the sound? <coughs> Problematical sort of thing. So many obstacles against success. You don't conquer a mountain. If you're lucky enough, the mountain gives you a chance to stand on the top. When you're out of your comfort zone is when you learn the most. Back in 1953, it was a great big question mark. Could it be done? There was a real race on. We are very pleased that the first stage of our journey to Mount Everest is over. This expedition was on a colossal scale. Ten climbers, film team, Sherpas. Everything you need to survive in places where human beings weren't designed to survive. The last hurrah of the British Empire. Only a few people would get a chance to go for the summit. Tenzing had more experience climbing on Mount Everest than anyone else. He was a mountaineer at heart. His drive was to go to the top, just like Ed Hillary. Above 26,000 feet is what we call the death zone because you are slowly dying. My father had quite a few demons. Well, I didn't have the complete conviction that we were going to be successful. There's just certain human beings able to put one foot in front of the other. They had the courage to push on into the unknown. So Ed took the gamble. That little internal voice going, this is Everest. You've got to go the extra distance. We're on the other end of the road. <laughs> that's what that's all about. I think that will just stop them or will it automatically replay most of Well, look, you know, before I went to the Royal Geographical Society, I thought about, you know, what is so special 60 years on about the climb of a mountain. And I wrote this little piece that, that I um, used at the Royal Geographical Society for that 60th anniversary. Well, Ed Hillary and Tenzing Norgay just wanted to climb the mountain because no one had reached the summit. It never occurred to them that this daring climb into the physical and physiological unknown expanded the realm of possibility for every one of us down near sea level. The fact that we too could climb the highest mountain if we wanted to. And in the same way, Neil Armstrong expanded our perception of what was possible by putting a boot print on the moon. Most of us will never climb Mount Everest or land on the moon, but we know we can. This is a giant leap in terms of what we think is possible, and now we know there are few barriers to our capability given the skills, innovation, motivation, time, and teamwork. The truth is we are all liberated by the successes of others because their successes <coughs> show that it can be done. Well, one of those successes, I believe, is conservation. Uh, not conservation versus development, but conservation as a part of development. 
That really is the key. Now, I remember as a schoolboy, and I'm sure many of you will too, the oft quoted, oh, well, that's progress, meaning chopping all the trees down, flooding lakes and valleys, <coughs> polluting the air, covering everything in concrete and industrial waste. It's all inevitable because that's progress and you can't stop progress. But we live in a time when many people see progress as embracing conservation and protecting the environment and indeed looking after ourselves and our futures by caring for the place where we live. And in many ways, the fortunes of our mountain parrot, the Kia, and our unique avian fauna is emblematic of all of this. Now, it's not well known that the Hillary family have a history in parks, conservation, outdoor education, and trails. I mean, you know, over in the West, Ed Hillary made the first ascent of Everest and built lots of schools and hospitals. But the conservation environmental area was an incredibly important part of our family history. In fact, at the beginning of the 20th century, my great-grandmother, my old Grand Rose, gave King School in Auckland their playing fields and bush reserve for the use of the students. My maternal grandfather, Jim Rose, who ended up being president of the New Zealand Alpine Club, went on to gift the iconic West Coast headland, Te Waha Point, to the Waitakere Regional Park and the people of New Zealand. Then in 2010, the Hillary Trail was established along the dramatic coastline of the west coast of Auckland. The trail is 70 kilometres long and walkers can take a little of the inspiration that Ed Hillary himself gave, as well as dreaming up lots of expeditionary plans while marching along the trails through the thick temperate rainforest and along the rugged coastline. My grandfather, Jim Rose, was on the board of Tongariro National Park, which of course was New Zealand's first national park and the world's fourth. Nearby is the Hillary Outdoors Education Centre, which runs outdoor programs for uh, people, young and old, who want to take advantage of the great outdoors. In the Nepalese Himalaya, my father initiated the establishment of the Sagamatha National Park, the park of Mount Everest, by getting our own Department of Conservation to work with the Nepalese National Parks to establish the world's highest and, well, some would say, most spectacular mountain preserve in the land of the Sherpas. Of course, this place meant a lot to my father ever since he and Tenzing Norgay made that first ascent of Mount Everest back in 1953. To this day, we continue to run schools and hospitals, forestry and environmental programs, all in the shadow of Mount Everest through a number of foundations, such as the American Himalayan Foundation, uh, the Cerebrum Hillary uh, Foundation in Canada, the Australian Himalayan Foundation, the Himalayan Trust UK, and of course the Himalayan Trust Nepal in New Zealand. So as a family, we consider conservation and parks and issues to do with the environment and people's engagement with the environment as integral to every other aspect of our lives. We think it is absolutely fundamental. So how do we engage the broader community in environmental issues? Well, I think you have to appeal to people's hearts. I think you've got to appeal to people's pockets and to their sense of pride. And really, it's not difficult to be proud of a Kia. They are the lively characters of our mountains. They are symbolic of the Southern Alps as much as they are the birds that live amongst them. It is hard to imagine our mountains without them. It would be terrible to imagine our mountains without them. But humanity tends to have a somewhat imperialistic view of our place in the world. For me, this is rather well characterized by the story of a Himalayan mountaineer. And his story had the rather presumptuous title, Higher Than Any Bird Can Fly, when the reality is 
And Himalayan mountains, including Mount Everest, the world's highest mountain, are basically dripping in birds. Yellow-billed chuffs, goric ravens, Tibetan mountain finches, lamagars, swifts, and high overhead, the bar-headed geese. So an important step is to deal with reality and to teach our children about the marvelous reality of the natural world. My education in this regard really started here in the Southern Alps. And uh, I wrote a little piece about my, my early experiences going up into the Matuki Valley. As a child, I remember visiting Mount Aspiring Station and my parents, with my parents back in the 1960s. We would drive up the wide Matuki Tuki River, fording streams in an assortment of Ed Hillary cars that were never really ideal for such rough terrain, including the Mini Cooper, the Golden Station wagon, and so on and went. Near the road end, we'd stop at a barn where an old telephone was nailed to a post, splattered with bird droppings and straw, and with a winder to ring the bell. Dad would call the Aspinalls, Aspinalls across the river, and soon a tractor with a trailer would come roaring across the great flats of the river and ford the river with a veritable bow wave. Jerry Aspinall was this tall, thin, confident man who ruled, or so it seemed to me as a ten-year-old, the wild valleys of this part of the Southern Alps. And in the cool evening air, we raced along the valley floor with mud and cow patties spinning off from the tractor tires and I felt this place and their life here seemed absolutely marvellous. We would often spend a few days with the Aspinall family at the old homestead in the East Matuki Tuki, and I developed a good friendship with Jerry and Phyllis's youngest son, Chris. From the homestead, Chris and I would run down to the sheep yards and the shearing sheds, the smell of wool and sheep poop and piles of lamb's tails and a carcass for dog tucker hanging from a roof beam, and the rust roughness of the slatted floor black with years of grease and grit. On the walls, pushed behind timber posts were old tools, wool shears, combs, axes, and mechanical odds and ends. And as we ran out to the sheepyards, I remember simply stopping in my tracks. I didn't know if it was the excitement of what I saw or some sort of deep despair. Along the fence were the silent frames of a dozen kias, their wings outstretched and their lot of the orange plumage exposed. Chris pointed to the peaks above and told me that these birds lived up there in the snow-capped peaks and they swooped down to the valleys and to the homestead. While all of this was a little unnerving, it was also well, intoxicatingly exciting to the child that I was then. In the cool air and lowering light, we would hear the piercing, rasping call of kias high above a homestead peak, and very quickly, the call of the kia in my young mind became synonymous with adventure, danger, the high Alps. Just last year, Chris Aspinall sent me an email, and he said, in his later years, Jerry Aspinall was an advocate for Kia preservation. His main conservation advocacy was about how we can live together in the environment. He told me that one time he was trying to catch a Kia with a piece of bacon with a string noose around the bait. A Kia looked at the situation, shifted the string to one side, and flew off with the bait. <laughs> when we lived at the old homestead, we regularly had Kia visitors, and they would sit on the roof and watch us eating at the table through the skylight in the roof. Some of them would perch on the spouting and watch proceedings at the kitchen sink. They were also very good at stripping the interior of cars at Raspberry Creek car park if anyone left a window wound down far enough for them to get in. Great fun for Kia. It is sad to see the Kia numbers declining. Many years ago, they would live in flocks of 10 to 20. Now it is rare to see more than four of them. So that was from Chris Aspinall. 
But you know, for me, it's rather marvelous to see people can change. Jerry Aspinall changed and supported Kia, and his kids are supporters too. You know, it's marvelous to be an advocate when you've had um, a marvelous wildlife interaction. And I think it's, it's easy to become an advocate when you've had something like that. And that is one of the, the incredible things about the Kia. The interactions, just seeing them and their playful ways are extraordinary. And I've had a number of experiences that have deeply affected me. And of course, some of them have been in the Himalayas. A few years ago, I was up in the Everest area with my two sons, George and Alexander. We got up in the dark, we hiked up through the uh, rhododendron forest up onto the sparsely grassed ridgeline at 4,200 meters, and we were waiting for the sun to come up to glimpse Mount Everest in the distance and the changing light. And while we're standing up there, uh, an old Sherpa friend of mine, Pasan Temba, grabbed me by the arm and goes, Peter, Peter, look down. And we're looking down a steep shadow gully on the western side of this ridge at 4,200 meters. And to my utter amazement, there, I'd always dreamed of seeing one. I'd never seen one, and I never thought I would see one because I'd never even seen any indication of one was a great snow leopard, 50 meters below us, moving swiftly up the steep gully with its long, thick diagnostic tail. And then, kind of perfectly enough, it just disappeared around a rocky ridge, and it was gone. But that thrilling sight is something, really, that reverberates in myself and my two sons and my Sherpa friends whenever we get together. We shared an experience and a vision of an extraordinary living creature. We were lucky to see it. And I've got to say, uh, Lou and I were just talking about another one of those experiences. Uh, when he was down in Southland, I was very fortunate to join Lou on a trip across to Codfish Island. And honestly, what an extraordinary place. To go out late one night, a cold winter's night with headlamps on, at about 10 p.m., uh, we located a kakapo who came stomping through the undergrowth and actually crawled up, I think it was your long john leggings, <laughs> and went around a ring around our shoulders and actually to sort of smell the musky scent of it, this big, hefty green parrot on your shoulder. It was just one of those quite extraordinary experiences and to see this population slowly but surely regaining um, uh, some sort of traction is truly a wonderful thing. You know, in a less species-specific way, in a more general ecological way, I've been fortunate to be a frequent visitor to South Georgia, which of course is a sub-Antarctic island southeast of South America. I've been going there for 12, 15 years and to have witnessed the astounding success of the um, just recently successful eradication of rats and the removal of the introduced reindeer there. To put it in context, South Georgia was a completely and utterly devastated ecosystem. It had very little going for it. In the early 1960s, the previous 100 years, every living thing had been dragged ashore, cut up, and thrown into tripods to make oil. This was the whales, the whales had gone, no one could find any. The seals had gone, they could, simply couldn't find any seals, elven seals, fur seals. And pretty much the same with a lot of the penguins. They took their eggs, they even threw king penguins into the tripods too. Um, the place was infested with rats, and the reindeer trampled um, the tussock grass, and the fragile nesting areas. Well, that era ended in the early 1960s. Probably the British government, or the South Georgia go government, as, it, as the, uh, the, that actual governing body is called, decided, you know, they, they really just abandoned it, wondered what they could do. And then eventually, the idea of conserving the island 
started to grow. And over the intervening 50 years, since those extraction um, industries um, ended, um, South Georgia has transitioned into one of the most marvelous wildlife experiences I can promise you anyone can have. Today, our biggest challenge when we go there is not finding the species, it's a parking place for your zodiac on a two kilometer long beach because there are so many damn king penguins, elephant seals, <laughs> yapping fur seals, you know, giant petrels, um, the, the local duck and the, the South Georgia pivot. It is truly an extraordinary experience. And I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that it's been New Zealand technology and know-how that helped to transform this place by doing bait drops, very scientifically by helicopter, and using GPS tracking and all the rest. And it really does show it can be done. They believe there are no rats on this 120 nautical mile long island. And already we're seeing a number of the more fragile species coming back, not in ones and twos, but flocks of South Georgia pippins, um, which really is very heartwarming to see. For me, I've got to say that, well, John Key's pledge, and you know, obviously coming from the Department of Conservation, to eradicate pests by 2050, well, all I can say is bravo. For me, that is some of the best news to come out of Wellington for ages. And I think it's an outstanding goal that is consistent with the successes on our own offshore islands by Doc and the work I've seen in South Georgia in the Southern Ocean. The eradication of pests on a grand scale is an environmental, but also, and I think this is extremely important, it's also a commercial challenge because it inspires innovation that could develop technologies that could be applied to environments around the world and thus provide numerous commercial opportunities. And I think this commercial application is really, really important. We all know that you know, there are a number of things that will motivate us to make a difference. You know, things to our hearts and our sense of who we are, but our pockets, the finances of it is a big thing. And if we develop great new technologies for pest control, every country on the planet has got issues with these sorts of things, particularly creatures like rats. We can be able to take advantage of this. But the environmental benefits for New Zealand unquestionably would be remarkable. Of course, all of this would be immensely beneficial to our care. However, this requires us to do something new, approach things differently, and that is not always the default setting for our expectations. And I just wanted to share you a story, I guess, from one of my own experiences in this whole issue of expectations. I, I just skied a new route up the Shackleton Glacier across Antarctica to the South Pole. There were three of us. We got to the pole. We had these Iridium satellite telephones and one of the first calls we got was from a radio producer, a um, television producer in New York City. And he wanted me, as soon as we got back to the perimeter of the continent, to get back to New Zealand, to fly to New York City to be interviewed on The Late Show with David Letterman. And, um, you know, I mean, look, it was a bit of a shock, really, to be suddenly taken out of my expedition gear, given a good shower, eating normal food, and transported to New York City in the set middle of wintertime. And there I am, feeling a little anxious. You know, I mean, I'd seen the David Letterman show before, and I knew that basically most of his guests were just cannon fodder. And I did wonder what was really going, going to happen to me. And I remember putting on the suit and going out and getting in the stretch limousine that they'd sent for me. You know, those huge, long, American-style limousines with black-tinted windows and feeling a bit like sort of an undercover agent. <laughs> I was driven across Manhattan through Broadway and eventually down a little side road 
to the Ed Sullivan Theatre where they filmed <coughs> the David Letterman show. And as I approached the entrance to the Ed Sullivan Theatre, there was this large crowd of about 200 people there. And they became absolutely frantic, the car pulling up, and, you know, and then someone, you know, opened, and you could see they had autograph books and cameras, and they're sort of hooping and hollering, and someone opens the door, and out steps this bald Antipodean. <laughs> the disappointment in this crowd. <laughs> I mean, they really were really very upset. The, the driver had just told me, I mean, I did say to him, what's going on here? He said, didn't they tell you But the other guest on the show was Brooke Shields? <laughs> I don't know how it was for Brooke when she <laughs> But it wasn't a problem for me. They just spread a little track and I just walked through the midst of them. They all put their autograph books on their cameras and legs. And I went into the sort of the holding area. Now, you may know a bit about the media, and they do have their techniques for sort of manipulating it. What they do is they put you in a room euphemistically called the green room. <laughs> It's actually solitary confinement. <laughs> you get out of there. They feed you on a diet of black coffee uh, to make you even more nervous, so you're sort of shaking around <laughs> like that. They very helpfully put a, a video monitor in the corner of the room <laughs> so that you can see with your own eyes what Mr. Letterman is doing to other victims. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a knock on the door. It's, you know, like the gallows knock. And uh, by then, I was a complete wreck. <laughs> I've been on this expedition for nearly three months with two guys who we weren't talking that much, and suddenly I'm in New York, the home of talkers, And uh, I mean, let out, and they physically propel you onto the set. There is no, would you like to take a step? <laughs> you are literally shoved out there, the in studio orchestra is playing, uh, which is touching. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, the audience is, is clapping, and you, I just walked across the stage, and there's David Letterman. And he shakes me by the hand and goes, Welcome, Peter Hillary, welcome to the show. You've just established a new route across Antarctica. I said, yes, that's right. He said, what was wrong with the old? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where do you <laughs> What do you do? But of course, you know, this was all jest. It was a late night TV uh, show audience. And, but the moral of the story, I guess, is yes, we do need a new enlightened ways of, of, of doing things, not just the old one. So how do we raise the profile of the Kia? Of course, speaking to, at schools, speaking to children, community groups, is incredibly important. Telling stories that engage people with Kia is important too. I think, you know, let's make Kia the mascot of a lot of our alpine regions and organizations. Not everything needs uh, a rotund, flightless bird. <laughs> Now, hey, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a fan of kiwis, I really am. But let's add a, a, a Kia to the New Zealand Alpine Club logo, or maybe the FMC, and a lot of our Southern Alps regions of New Zealand as well. The Kia so well epitomizes the idea of the freedom of the hills and the ethos of the mountaineer's book of the same name. In the words of the late Doug Tompkins, founder of the outdoor equipment label The North Face and the clothing brand Esprit and a remarkable conservationist and climber, and this was printed in his funeral service literature. This is what he wrote. We collectively just have to be a lot smarter than we, ha than we have been up to now. Even if the future looks absolutely hopeless, being a hardcore eco-social activist and going down with the ship of Mother Earth will be a dignified way to go. There is nothing better to do anyway, and with no better class of human beings, at least in my view. Caring for all the other creatures on the planet is righteous work. We can be proud of that work right to the bitter end if it does come, in fact, to that. 
If someone has a better answer for these existential questions, please let me know. It is good to remember that one is either an activist or an inactivist. Ask yourself what you are in this regard, and you might be surprised at the answer. Well, I've got to say, I feel I'm amongst a group of activists in this, this area, and, and that's um, a wonderful experience. You know, here in New Zealand, we have a particularly good opportunity to make a difference with the environment and the creatures that live in it. For a start, we have no borders with other countries. That makes things a lot simpler. And we still have vast areas of natural environments that other people around the world can really just dream about. So, to make a difference, we need to be proactive, we need to be smart, we need to be innovative, we need to engage. I guess all a little bit like the attributes of the Kia, really. You know, in the end, the challenge is not about the environment, it's about people. That really is the challenge. Thank you.